We are living in one of the most polarizing times in terms of the public conversation that I can remember in 40 years of adult life. And we are being invited to be the people of God in this very world. What is Jesus inviting us to? What is on the heart of Jesus for his people in such a time as this? And how does Jesus' prayer that we would be one as he and the Father are one provide guidance for us now? This is what we'll talk about on today's Unhurried Living podcast. I recently enjoyed a conversation with Greg Holder about his book, The Genius of One. Here's the description of what that book's about. The world is fractured, tensions are high, patience is low, and goodwill is hard to come by. In The Genius of One, author Greg Holder reminds us of the high value Jesus and his early followers placed on community and offers guidance for how to see and relate to one another in emotionally and spiritually healthy ways so that we, the church, can fulfill Jesus' prayer for us and model a better way of loving on one another in a fractured world. Tracing back to a prayer Jesus prayed on the worst night of his life, that they, that we, would be one, Holder takes his readers on a winding journey from that glorious prayer to the practical realities of everyday life. Greg's passion for cooperative relationships shines through with his unique brand of humor and storytelling. For those who cling to the hope that God is still at work, this book will both stir a deeper longing for a better way and provide practical steps toward that way. Doesn't that sound like something we need today, maybe more than we've ever needed before? Just a little bit about who Greg is. He's a pastor, author, speaker, and storyteller. He's been the lead pastor for 20-plus years at The Crossing, a multi-site church that reaches 8,000-plus people across four campuses in the St. Louis, Missouri area, and a thriving online community. He's the author of The Genius of One, Advent Conspiracy, and a translator of the Book of Jeremiah for the Voice Bible. The Genius of One conference has trained 1,000-plus pastors across India, Kenya, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. With a diverse assortment of interest, gifts, and training, including degrees in psychology and counseling, Greg brings unique insight into the development of God-honoring relationships. Greg's next book, Never Settle, will be released in fall 2020 through Nav Press. Now, here's our conversation. Greg, it's great to be able to have these moments with you. I've enjoyed beginning to read your book, The Genius of One. Thanks for writing it, and thanks for this moment to have this conversation. This is great. I'm just glad that we get a chance to connect, Alan. I know we were talking just a second ago how your work is blessing our church, and we loved mm. having you on our podcast and just, just talking about how th- there are things that our souls crave that we need to be paying attention to. And I think I actually think these things intersect. Oh, I agree with you. I think you're exactly right. And uh I'd love to just begin by sure. hearing you tell a little bit of the story of how it is that this book came to be, some of the yeah. story leading up yeah. to the content and just the yeah. journey that you're on yeah. bringing this birth, birth, uh, birth well, to this book. It, you know, I, j- just to give it to you quickly, the, um, I was privileged to have a mom and dad who, who followed Jesus, who oh. led me into a relationship with him early in my life. I will mm-hmm. tell you that they were very involved in churches. These were not big churches. Uh, at least at first, but it seemed like no matter where we were, there was a a a sense of of conflict, and I'm going to say now unhealth. And I remember a distinct moment, and I, I write it in the prologue, where we were driving home from church, and my mom looked over at my dad there in the front seat with tears. She looks at him and says, "How can Christians treat each other this way?" Oh. Now I'm six, seven years old at that time, and I distinctly remember thinking something's wrong here. I mean, I'm, I'm a little boy, but I'm already, to be honest with you, I'm already kind of pushing a little bit of this away. Not my faith with Jesus, not even involvement in the church, never left the church. Uh, I don't have any interesting sordid chapters in the early parts of the book where I took a big detour, but I really began to wonder if anybody had let God know just how broken things were in the church. And, mm. and so the long story short, God led me through a 
a path calling me to ministry the whole way. <clears throat> Along the way, we get involved in a very small church. I feel called to be a part of that church uh, on their leadership team and eventually calling me out of the marketplace into ministry. Hmm. There was a distinct night, uh, really a definitive night for us where we were, we used to meet in a, in a community theater uh, a, a, adjacent to a YMCA, it had about 350 seats. Hmm. No way were we going to fill that theater that, that day. And in fact, wow. it kind of got depressing. It was like, we felt like BBs in a box, just, you know, everybody spread out. And so I said that night, uh, wasn't the pastor yet, but just said, can we all meet up on the stage of this community theater? Let's just get chairs and put them in a circle and we'll worship and we'll talk to each other. And there was a there was a moment where we looked at each other and said, okay, we think God has called us to this, which was really profound for me. Mm. But then secondly, God showed me that that he wasn't finished with the church, that he wasn't finished with calling us into better relationships. And we looked at each other and said, can we do this differently? Um, and along the way, uh, we've tried to do it differently, not perfectly. I could tell you chapter and verse of ways that we don't get this right. We're constantly going back and having to learn these things. But there was a moment when I said, okay, Lord, if we're going to get into this thing, can we please do this differently? And, and will you create a, a different church than the one I grew up in? So that's kind of how this happened. And then through that, some study of particular passages, looking at certain things in uh, just relationships and it all it all really flowed out of John 17 after that. Yeah. Wow. Well, maybe in, in the spirit of, of, of that story, um, you talk early on, I was reading uh, about a particular Hebrew word. Yeah. And yeah. about the importance of that word and how that word um, yeah. really guided you in, in some of what Absolutely. you're writing about. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it really, even though the New Testament is obviously not written in Hebrew, uh, I'm I'm imagining, and I'm not alone in this, that, of course, Jesus understood the, the Shema because it was the, probably the first confession that he was taught as a little boy, which in itself is mind-blowing that Jesus mm. would humble himself to the point where he has to learn these things. So, you that know, that's amazing. a different conversation. But uh, the first thing that he might have been taught is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so the, the Hebrew word for one there is the word echad. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of folks that, that, that talk about this word. It at the very least begins to hint that there is more to the one in the one. There is one God. That is the number one point of the Shema. Uh, Israel, there's one God. Don't pay attention to these other gods. But in that is, is sort of this idea that there, there is more to this oneness than even the early Hebrews could have understood. And you see Paul trying to figure this out in real time in the New Testament. There is one God. He never stopped believing the Shema, but because of Jesus and his ministry, somehow there is more to the one and the one. Now you take all of that, now go to the worst night of Jesus' life. Mm. It's the night he's betrayed. At some point between dismissing Judas and saying, you know, if you're going to do this, then go. Some po at some point between that and, and the garden, Jesus prays the longest prayer that we have on record in John 17. Everyone, you know, all of your listeners will no doubt note this prayer. Hmm. But in that prayer, it's interesting to me that Jesus doesn't pray when he's praying for us. And he does pray for us, he prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. And then he prays for those who would believe because of their testimony. Well, that's you and me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get really interested when Jesus is praying for me. He doesn't pray that we would have the coolest church or the most uh, cost efficient church. He doesn't pray that we would be the, the biggest church or that we would win all of the theological debates. He doesn't pray that we'd be the coolest kids on the block. He prays that, you know, this, he prays that we would be one as yeah. he and the father are one. I think that reaches back to that ancient, beautiful, we can't even fully describe it idea of father, son, and spirit loving, serving submitting, championing each mm -hmm. other. That's a pretty high standard, Alan, but I think that's what God has called us to. Oh, that's, that's really powerful. You know, the, the idea that Father, Son, and Spirit are perfectly united and that we're invited yes. somehow into the community of yes. Father, Son, and Spirit is, is a remarkable thing that I don't, I don't hear a lot about 
yeah. uh, from my friends, you know, my brothers and sisters. And it also strikes me, you know, in all the years I've been following Jesus, I don't know, I could probably count on a hand if it took all my fingers, how many sermons or teachings from John 17 I've actually heard. And yet, as you say, yeah. it's the longest prayer of Jesus we have access to. It is, it is. And if you keep reading, it's connected to mission. Mm. You know, that they may be one so that the world will know that you sent me. I mean, it's all connected. And I can't think of a, a more timely thing for us to be considering in these not friendly times. And and, yeah. and we see things flying around, you know, whether it be on social media or even just in the neighborhoods and conversations around the table. Uh, this could be a distinctive for us. If, if we who know Jesus could actually treat each other differently, and I am not suggesting that every conversation end in a group hug. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that that we're called to a different standard. And when we do this, the world can't help but notice. Mm. We're not perfect. And th- of course we're not perfect. But there is something distinctly different, countercultural, about loving one another this way. Yeah. And what what a beautiful thing. I mean, what a way for us to be missional. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's so important. As you say, you know, we're, we're recording this in the midst of some pretty significant election realities. Indeed, indeed. Uh, it'll probably air while still all of this is very live for us. Um, the public conversation just seems so antagonistic these days. And then what Christians are known for is not necessarily this John 17 prayer of of Jesus' heart. I'd love to hear you say a little more about how it might be that this prayer of Jesus for unity, that we might be one, how that might actually be a a critical witness of the people of God to the world in which we we find ourselves. Well, I mean, we can go a a variety of different ways, but I'll tell you this, uh, even the way that we tend to maintain to to create culture inside our churches so those who are pastors and those who are leaders uh there is there's a there's a call to shepherd that flock we know that there's a call to protect that flock we know that but what about us cultivating this kind of culture within our church setting because i don't know how realistic it is for us to to enter into conversations in the world, if I can use that term, if we haven't figured out how to do this with people who who have experienced the same grace that we have. I mean, you know, you and I have the spirit coursing through our lives. We have a mm. we have a shot at this like nobody else in the world to 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 do this together, even when we don't agree on things. So I think I think for many leaders, I would suggest start there. Mm-hmm. Are we willing to pay attention to healthy culture in chi- inside our churches? Are we willing to go out of our way to create uh, learning experiences and, and community experiences around tables and in settings, in sermons, in classes, where we actually pull some of this stuff apart and say, uh, so this is how it looks in real time. And I will, I, I will, you know, Alan, there's a, there's a funny story in the book and, and, you know, uh, I love to fly fish. Ah. One of the great things about fly fishing is you usually do it in beautiful places in the world, right? I mean, it's just, you get to those corners of creation. Ah. Well, it's complicated and I don't know if you do it or have done it, but you've got to, I'm not very good at it. I'm getting better, but you have to think about it. So, you know, you want it to look like, you know, you want it to look like it is in that movie in your mind. Right. Uh, And you're concentrating the whole way. All right. Well, in addition to that, we were in, uh, Sometimes we get a chance to to fish in Alaska, which means you're on these very remote streams. And it's wonderful. It's beautiful. This is where some of the great salmon are. It's great. But that's also where the Alaskan brown bear fattens up for the winter. Now, the theory is that he's not that interested in you because there are so many salmon floating through the same streams and rivers that you're fishing in that you're not really on the menu. Okay, so that's what they train you. That's how you do this. And if you ever see one, then you're supposed to back away. And there's some ridiculous training that they give you. And I go into that in the book. The Mm. point is, I've been in situations where I was so intent 
on catching fish. I was so intent on doing it right and, and, and getting that fish on the hook that I actually forgot to pay attention to everything else that was happening. And there were times, have been times, probably will be again, where I'm so intent on the fishing that I did not notice that there was a neighbor in the stream with me. Mm. And you have to back away at that point. Well, the point is you need to pay attention, not just to what you're doing, but also everything in your surroundings and what's happening. Now, the way that we say it in the book is when it comes to leading churches is how we do what we do is as important as what we do. Mm. So oftentimes as leaders, we get very focused on a, on a point, on a goal, on a, on a season. Hey, we've got to do this. And God has given us that. God has given us that burden, that vision. Gang, let's go. Let's, we got to take this hill. That is so important as a leader to have that. Mm. But you better also pay attention to how you do what you do. Because I personally am tired of hearing about ministries that checked off all the boxes of, wow, we were successful in this, this, and this area. But out back, there's a pile of bodies and there's a, a wake of harmful, destroyed relation. It's just it's bad stuff back there. Yeah. So the, the kicker line of the book is you got to keep one eye on the fish and one eye on the bear. So hmm. as leaders, we need to pay attention to the mission. This is where we're going. But you better pay attention to how we're doing what we're doing, because there is danger lurking that wants nothing more, evil wants nothing more than to destroy the relationships that we have with each other. If he yeah. can't get in the front door with some headline busting failure, he's going to try to slip in some unlocked window and see if he can get you and I sideways with each other, Alan. And so we're trying to call people at, at the very least start there. Can you pay attention to how you're creating culture and how you're teaching people about language and conflict resolution and the evil of gossip. And there's just a variety of things in the book that we talk about. That's really helpful. As I was hearing you sort of unpack that, it, it strikes me that um, sometimes we go after a kind of unity that's more about being on the same page in interests or having the same socioeconomic sort of uh, right. experience, or right. we came from, come from the same geography. But Jesus is talking about a, a unity that's a little more deep rooted than that, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And it's more resilient. Yeah. I mean, just look at his disciples. I mean, you have you have fellows that simply should not have when you have a disciple who is a part of a political, really revolutionary party called a zealot. And he's in that same small group with a guy that's on the inside of the system who's a tax collector. They probably disagreed about a lot of what you and I would call politics. Sure. But because of Jesus, now we have these things that are in common, and we begin to, we actually begin to put less weight on those as the solutions for the ills of our world. And we, I know it sounds simplistic, and I don't mean it that way, but it really, you come back to, well, wait, what do we have in common? Let's at least start there. Mm. And I don't expect, in fact, it's not a matter of if we're going to disagree, it's a matter of when we're going to disagree. Yeah. And so we just want our folks to be equipped with that and to not be thrown by, oh, okay, well, here you go. We disagree about this. Or, wow, I, was, I wasn't I was very good at paying attention to you yesterday in that meeting. Or, or you know, you were tired and you, there's just so many ways we got to pay attention to this. And I think if we set the standard for being perfect around each other, that's ridiculous. I also think if we set the standard for just this overly sweet, smarmy let's just you know mm. keep it on the surface kiss kiss we're all going to love each other in heaven kind of superficial relationship our souls don't want that mm. we want something resilient where we go well wait we could do this together and yeah. learn from each other along the way absolutely yeah um you described at one point a, a game that none of us can afford to play yeah. what is the danger of of that game and and how can we as christians avoid yeah. Those pitfalls. yeah. Um, I'll give you another quick story. Uh, our main campus is uh, just one property over from a golf course. Mm. And so a gentleman was there who uh, attends our church. And so he's the one who told me this story and he's with one of his buddies. 
uh, and they're on a tee at, at one end of the golf course. And his friend, this is a true story, turns around and aims like his back is now a, to the to the hole. So he's literally now aiming in exactly the wrong direction. He's got it teed up. He's got it teed up. He's ready to go. And he takes a swing and he he whacks this ball in exactly the opposite direction. Mm. And my buddy said, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm aiming at that church. And he goes, you are. Now he didn't know my friend went to this church. He goes, I hate that church. Oh. And my friend was like, oh my goodness, why? And he said, because some people from our church are now going to that church. And I hate that church. Now I want to be real clear with you. I'm not the victim here. We're not the victim. Uh, I'm not, I'm not about, you know, um, swapping folks, uh, you know, and, and just playing a, you know, musical pews game. I'm not about that, even though we don't have pews. Uh, yeah. I'm not about that. I even understand if it's a church that is struggling and he's going, well, wait, why is, why isn't something happening at our church? I understand all of that. So please, we make these mistakes all the time. But the point is, he was buying into the lie that uh, this is a zero-sum game. That's the game we can't afford to play. Mm. You know, uh, uh, gaming uh, theorists are the ones who really came up with that. And a zero-sum game is uh, the, the game always has to end in zero. So if it's plus one on one side, it has to be minus one on the other. The simple way to put that is, if you win, I lose. Yep. And I see this happening with Christians, particularly between churches. The, the way we kind of map it out in the book, it's, it, it's between churches. It can be between denominations. It can also be between churches and parachurch organizations. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen between Christian uh, nonprofits and churches yep. or Christian nonprofits and Christian nonprofits. And so we come away with this idea, well, if you get the headline, we'll be ignored. If you get the funding we won't have money. If people come to Christ at your church, then we're going to shrink. If you grow, we get. And so we start to believe this lie that we're in competition with each other and we're not. Yeah. If it's this beautiful genius of one that God has called us to work together as one, then another step that I believe Christian leaders in particular need to take is how do I foster relationships with other churches with other organizations? How do I create space where we can actually do some of these things together? Not becoming one, not denying that my church is different from your church, but how do we create some space in between the two of us where we could collaborate on something? Mm. It's a huge risk, but every time I've seen it happen, there is such a relief on both sides. And God blesses that kind of abundance mentality instead of a scarcity mentality. I yeah. mean, it's all his anyway, when I can remind myself of that. And I am not saying that I'm not susceptible because we all have these little insecurities where we go, Oh, wow. That happened for them. What about us? <laughs> yes. It's just, it's, it's again, that's, it's how evil just eats at us a little bit. But anytime we lean into to, to what I believe God has called us to do, there's relief, there's blessing. There's stories that pop out of that that wouldn't have come anyplace else. We can't afford to play the zero-sum game. That's the point, Alan. That's a yeah. game we can no longer afford to play. So part of the vision then is this, this, um, this vision of unity that Jesus prays for, this sense that there's only one kingdom. You know, there's not yes. my kingdom and their yes. kingdom and this kingdom and that kingdom. Um, I think some people see that as, as you say, the, the zero sum game, like there's only so much to go around instead of there being a kingdom um, whose king is immense. Yes. Omnipotent. Yes. yes. Who uh, blesses so that we'll be bl uh, blessing others. Yeah. Who loves the image of a river of living water that might flow from every single one of us and, and each community of us that's such yes. a different vision isn't it than the uh if they're doing good well i must be then doing poorly yeah and you're right on it when you say it's it's it, you know it's not my kingdom it's his i know we yeah. know that but sometimes we forget that and isn't this doesn't this don't you think that this intertwines with with 
some of your thoughts and the and the ministry that you guys are are really challenging the kingdom to you know to pay attention to yeah. what your soul longs for. Yeah. If you really can take just a second and breathe, do you really want to be competing with other people, or is there a better way? Because I think that's that's what I'm seeing is that there's a that's what I mean by relief when people go, oh wait, this is what my soul was aching for. I I didn't want to play that game. Mm. It's just a profoundly different way to to look at things. And I think for me anyway, when that happens and people start to do that, it's almost like the spirit says, oh, you want to play at that level? I'm going to move in now. Let me show you some things. Let me give you ideas and and ways to collaborate that you never dreamed possible. Yes. That's, That's really what I love. Good. Yeah, I, it makes me think, you know, part of what you're talking about in the book is the the value, the importance of cultural health, which of course also implies personal wholeness and, and health. And I talk to some leaders and you almost get the sense from them that it's it's an either or. Either we'll give time and attention. It's another zero sum game. Yeah. Either we're personally and culturally healthy or we're really making a difference in the world missionally and organizationally. Yeah. And so you sort of have this teeter totter of you know, it's an either or sort of situation, but you're saying something very different than that. It's, 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 it's a lie to think it's an either or, and yeah. let's just go back to what Jesus prayed that we would be one so that, and then read the rest of that so that we would be on mission so that, so that the kingdom would advance so that people would know who Jesus was. He's the one that connected those dots, not me. I mean, this is, this is not, you know, this, but this is not new stuff. This is, this is a really old, obvious point right there in the new Testament. And I think, I think maybe, I don't know, as you were speaking, I I, do, do you think that maybe part of that trap is that we think pridefully um, and believe me, again, I'll say I, I I'm susceptible, but we think pridefully, well, if I don't do that, it probably won't get accomplished because God mm. has given us all of these resources and these great ideas. And we've got to do that because we love Jesus and you know, we're winning the world. Yeah. And so in a weird way, it, it, it turned back into something about me mm. instead of our King. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think it's tempting to feel that you know God's given us a work to do, but in some odd way, God's back at the home office, just hoping we'll do it right, you know. And boy, <laughs> if we don't, the whole thing's just gone. It's and yet, I, I think Jesus' favorite image for this collaboration into which we're invited is that yoke, that we yes. are with Him in the yes. yoke. That you know, Jesus does what the Father does. He He speaks the words the Father speaks, and then Jesus says, "Hey." come, come to me, come follow me. Let's do this together. That's a very different vision than the vision of ministry is me doing something for God. And, and if I don't, the nothing will happen. Yeah. Yeah. And it really does come down to trusting that he knows better than we do about this. I mean, it's mm. his yoke. Yeah. It's his that's yoke. Right. Um, that's great. That's great. It, that it, it, it comes back to this idea of, of, humility, which is one of the, the hallmark uh, ingredients. It's really the secret sauce to this whole thing. There's a, there's a whole chapter mm. on, on that and how we have to choose that. But you do see that humility. Here's an extraordinary thought that I don't fully understand. You see that humility within the Trinity. You have an yeah. all-powerful triune God and, and Father, Son, and Spirit celebrate each other and champion each other. I, it's, it's beyond it's really beyond what I can fully imagine. Probably why I struggle with it so much, but it's true. Mm. Yeah. And you know, that, that vision of, of humility, um, you know, in my own experiences, in my own travels, it's become very plain to me that humility may not be our strong suit in a Western or especially perhaps North American, you know, context. Yeah. I, I, I run into leaders, pastors and other leaders in other international contexts and I realized oh gosh uh, some flavor of pride it has been a big part of our vision of ourselves and and, in almost a sense of our operating system and that surely doesn't lead to uh, to unity very very well 
I agree. I agree. It doesn't lead to, uh, you know, I, I've used the word a couple of times, but it doesn't lead to collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's, that's a part of this is that there's, there are still wonderful, beautiful things that God has in store for us to accomplish in the kingdom, but we're not going to do it separated from each other. No, that's right. You know, I mean, obviously the other big passage that we, that we bump into in, in this book is, you know, Paul's metaphor of the body in places like Romans 12 and, you know, I, I think I, I I don't have the exact quote anymore in my head, but it's something like you know your 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 liver isn't going to do you much good sitting over in that corner of the room. It needs to right. be connected to the body. Yes. Well, we 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 got to pay attention to that. Yeah. And I I would say this. I I would be curious what your thoughts are when you say um, you've seen this around the world. I have too. Hmm. Have you also seen here? a hunger for that kind of um, humility, collaboration, particularly in younger generations. Yeah, isn't that something? Yeah. That's exactly right. I, um, I, I see the tension of my younger friends, brothers and sisters in, in leadership uh, between their instinct, their intuitive sense that, that this, the self-promoting yeah. sort of thing isn't in the spirit of Jesus. And yet they're often in organizational environments where this is in fact the operating system. And I see the tension, uh, you know, in their, in their hearts, in their lives, uh, their struggle, they're wrestling with, can I stay in this organizational reality right. and be who I, I believe God's called me to be? It's a, it's a real challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, we're not called to do everything together. So there is, you know, there's a, there's like two chapters in the book where uh, one of them is about uh, really, what does it mean for us to creatively collaborate together and do this together? And then the other chapter basically says, but I do have my own work that I have to do. Now, I don't do it apart from you, but we can't play. I think I use the example in the book of uh, when one of my daughters was learning how to play soccer. Uh, and I'm sure you've, experience this with someone, but it starts off as swarm ball because nobody, nobody has their spacing. Nobody has, the, they're all just doing everything together. Yeah. Well, there comes a moment where we all have to kind of spread out and go, wait, okay, you're really good at this, Alan. Uh, knock yourself out. I'll see you on Tuesday or I'll say, I'll check in with you. There's this tension between I have work to do that God has gifted me and called me to do. And I have to do it and stay connected to the body on this. And, you know, we humans just love to swing from one extreme to the other on this. So that's another thing as we go around, uh, even around the world, where we, we'll talk about truly discovering what has God wired you to do. Now get after it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've really enjoyed hearing your heart and, and, and interacting about this really critical and core sort of kingdom theme. Uh, you, uh, I believe you've got another book coming out here sometime soon. I wonder yeah, if you can give us a little bit of a preview. And then sure. also anything you might tell us about how people could take a next step uh, yes. toward you and the work that you're doing. Sure. Well, let's let's start with that one. Um, the easiest way is gregholder.com. And from there, then you'll be able to hear some things about these books. We've got resources for mm. Genius of One. And uh, a lot of churches are taking this and saying, as you would know, and saying, wait, I think we can get in smaller settings and use this as a small group kind of discussion matter. And so there's that sort of a thing. Yeah. Um, the new book is entitled Never Settle, hmm. uh, Choices, Chain Reactions, and the Way Out of Lukewarminess. Uh, so it's a riff. If the first book was a riff on John 17, this is a the jumping off point for this book is Revelation 3, oh where boy. Jesus says, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm, and we know what he thinks about that. And so the point there is be hot, be cold. There are ways that we can be uh, we can be thirst quenchingly cold and we can address the thirst of this world. There's ways that we can be soothing and healing and, and, and wonderfully comforting. Just don't be lukewarm. And so mm. a lot of the book is a sort of a personal journey for folks of how do I just choose to not settle on some things? And we, we mm. walk through some very specific ways and, and, and steps that you can take out of lukewarmness. It's certainly not a formula, but it's, there's a few 
there's a few intersections on the road that you need to pay attention to and choices that ultimately do set off these beautiful chain reactions. And so that comes out September 15th and yeah. folks will be able to purchase that on Amazon and pre-order on Amazon. But yeah, that comes out uh, uh, September 15th. Well, it sounds like an important book. It also sounds really timely for where we find ourselves as the church in, in North America. So uh, I do hope our, our listeners will look now for, you know, the genius of one and then keep an eye for this. Next yes, title. yes, that would be great. And, uh, Thanks so much for the treat oh of this goodness. conversation. It's been a great pleasure, Greg. It's been a pleasure for me, and it's just fun to see ministries intersect. And so for us to be able to actually connect with each other this way, uh, it just makes it even better. So thank you, and and uh, can't wait to, to hear more about what's going on and what God's doing through you and through your ministry. Well, thanks, Greg. Wasn't that a great conversation? Doesn't your heart resonate with the prayer of Jesus that we would make it our highest value to be one as He and the Father are one? What might it look like in very practical terms in both your life and your work to pursue this priority? Let me remind you that if you're a member of our Unhurried community, you'll be able to see the video version of my conversation with Steve, as well as having access to some bonus content that came right after our podcast conversation ended. If you'd like to learn more about the community and about this particular resource, head on over to unhurriedliving.com slash community. There, you'll gain access to monthly training videos, guest interviews, and we'll connect you in a members-only Facebook group. We really would love to see you there. And as always, we love connecting with more and more friends like you who want to rest deeper, live fuller, and lead better. Thank you.